What is the vegan stance on horseback riding? Is riding horses cruel? Well, get ready to get controversial. Hi, it's Emily from Bite Size Vegan and welcome to another vegan nugget. Today's topic is something that I've been asked to cover by many of you out there, especially recently, so I've been doing my research. I want to first give thanks to Fair Horsemanship for all of her assistance and I'll tell you how to get connected with her later in the video. I'm first going to address the question of whether or not riding horses is vegan and then I'll move on to whether or not it's cruel. As I said in my video about wool, veganism in general is about opposing the use of animals for our own personal gains in any form whatsoever. If we look at horse horseback riding, it's evident that horses do not need to be ridden. Horseback riding solely benefits the rider, and so it is a form of using animals for our entertainment, which is explicitly not vegan. Now this is not a popular stance, and there are several arguments as to how riding benefits the horse. One of these is that domesticated horses need exercise. The most simple response to this is that domesticated dogs also need exercise, yet owners are able to provide this without having to mount them. A second argument is that riding provides a horse with an enriched environment. Again, this can be as easily achieved without someone atop them by walking the horse from the ground. A third argument is one that comes in many forms, but always starts with, but my horse loves, and ends with being ridden, going to shows, wearing a bridle, having a bit, running the barrels, or what have you. And perhaps there is some horse out there who actually likes to be ridden. But let's take a look at what riding does to a horse's body physically. What I'm going to cover is just a cursory look into the impact of horseback riding on horses. I have links to additional resources in the blog post for this this video, which is linked in the video description below, and I urge you to reference those studies if you want to delve deeper into this topic. Let's start with skeletal structure. There's a saying that a horse is ready to be ridden when their knees close. This refers to waiting until the growth plates just above their knees convert from cartilage to bone. Dr. Deb Bennett, in her article, Time and Rate of Skeletal Maturation in Horses, states that what people often don't realize is that there is a growth plate on either end of every bone behind the skull, and in the case of some bones, like the pelvis or vertebrae, which have many corners, there are multiple multiple growth plates. She goes on to detail the exact schedule of growth plate conversion to bone in horses. While many people start riding their horses around the age of two, Dr. Bennett's schedule shows that the last plates to fuse are in the vertebral column, and this does not occur until the horse is at least five and a half years old, with taller horses and males taking even longer. According to the text Practical Anatomy and Propagetic of the Horse, the length of time for complete growth of the epiphyseal plates, or cartilage, is not until they are, on average, between six and nine years old. The basic takeaway of all of that is that it's incredibly easy to damage a horse's back and displace his or her vertebral growth plates, causing pain and lasting injury. Aside from the issue of growth plate fusion, riding a horse at any age causes skeletal damage as well as muscle and tissue. Expert horseman Alexander Nevzorov states, a horse's back is not a seat, not a place for a human butt, not a piece of meat, not some sort of terra firma. It is a very complex and tender anatomical structure with extraordinary functions. Besides the obvious biomechanical function, the back has another very important function. The spinal cord's work is to guarantee that the responses from the entire nervous system can communicate the sense of taste, smell, vision, hearing, and vestibular function to the brain, not to get lost in too much detail. On this especially vulnerable, sensitive organ, onto the medulla spinalis, the brain of the back, sits a rider. In a 2007 study, out of the 295 horses who were considered physically sound upon initial examination, 91.5% were diagnosed with some kind of alteration on the spinal process after x-ray. Almost all Ways the spinal processes of the caudal saddle position were affected. In horseback riding, the spinal damage caused by weight alone is compounded by the use of saddles, harnesses, bits, and whips. Saddles restrict blood flow to the arterial capillary bed, causing tissue damage as well as general wear and chafing. But nothing is quite as cruel as the use of bits and whips, which I'm only going to give a cursory nod to in this video. Bits cause pain and damage to a horse's complex cranial nerves as well as their teeth, tongue, and palate. Facial nerves are extremely close to the skin and thus extremely sensitive. It is essential to understand that there is absolutely no way to use a bit without a horse feeling pain. And since I'm running short on time here, I'll just say this about using a whip. It's a whip! Now all of this is just barely scraping the surface of the horse issue. I haven't even addressed the practice of breaking horses, horse racing, the rodeo, and other topics, and I'll cover those in future videos. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it and please share it around with your friends and family. And if you're new to the channel, I would love to have you subscribe. Here at Bite Size Vegan, I address all aspects of veganism in always in five minutes or less. Now go live vegan and I'll see you soon.